Okay, so um, thank you very much, Bianca and Laura Balzano. Um, I uh, will talk to you today about something called low algebraic dimension matrix completion. So I'm glad I put myself after Mark uh, because he set me up very nicely here, okay? So um, first, I, I have a few slides in here um, that are maybe a little different than I normally include, uh, just because I want to talk also to some of the themes of the workshop, or at least you know, some of the, um, the discrepancies we might see between people like me in optimization and numerical analysis versus people in uh, actual applications versus people in statistics. Um, so uh, one thing that I think we've seen throughout the entire workshop is that basically in many, many applications and any place where you're collecting a lot of data, you will have missing data, okay? So occlusions in, computers, uh, in computer vision problems, um, uh, faulty sensors and environmental sensing and so on. So this is really a very important issue and we need to attack it from all the different angles. Um, Maybe the most obvious fundamental assumption that all of us are making when we're trying to do missing data imputation is that there is some functional or some relationship between the observed and unobserved variables, okay? Um, and so uh, what I'm gonna talk about is in matrix completion and as um, Mark you know, set me up, um, we're just asking, is there a functional relationship among these entries that we can assume and then uh, that allows us to impute um, the missing values, okay? So um, given this chosen functional relationship, we would have some questions we try to ask. Uh, I can uh, say them quickly since Mark basically said exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, how many entries do we need to observe so that we can uniquely complete the matrix? In what pattern should they be observed? And then how do we recover them algorithmically? Um, and these problems have essentially been solved by uh, this new problem area called low rank matrix completion, okay? Um, I have a caveat here, uh, which is that the interesting statistical problems, which are how to quantify uncertainty uh, in the resulting imputation or in the actual functional relationship, like in the low rank case, how to quantify uncertainty in the latent factors or the principal components. Um, those are still uh, fairly open questions, though we have some very recent interesting work in that direction. Um, but this uh, work that I'm gonna tell you about uh, sticks to the numerical analysis perspective and asks the same matrix completion questions for a new model. So we're changing that functional relationship to be not one of linear low rank, but uh, one where the matrix columns lie in a, in a nonlinear algebraic variety. The work I'm telling you about is a collaboration with um, Rob Nowak and Daniel Pimentel, who are at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Greg Anji, my former postdoc, who's now at Marquette University, and Rebecca Willett, who's at the University of Chicago. Okay, so um, I want to first define an algebraic variety for those of you who this isn't a familiar concept. So an algebraic variety is the solution set of a, a collection of polynomial equations, okay? And usually uh, we think of those equations as being um, some polynomial in the entries of X. So if X is a d-dimensional vector, we have d variables uh, in that uh, vector, and it's a polynomial in those variables. Um, and there's usually uh, no constant term. We, we just say all of these polynomials are equal to zero, okay? So any X that satisfies all of these simultaneously uh, will be part of the set, which is called the algebraic variety defined by these polynomial equations. Oh, and I've, I've drawn here, you know, you could say, uh, we may uh, say it's a linear polynomial, uh, a linear function, in which case we, go right back to the low rank matrix completion model. So that in some sense is a specific case of algebraic variety. Another specific case is the union of subspaces. Um, this is a, an interesting model people have used for a variety of applications. Um, and you can see that uh, by looking, if we have these say three planes, uh, each one is defined by a linear function. 
uh, that's what I've drawn F1, F2, F3. If those are linear, uh, they each define one of these planes on the image. Uh, but then if we take a new polynomial, which is the product of those three, you can see that any x that satisfies one of them, say an x that lies in the red plane and satisfies f3 x of x equals zero, will also satisfy this new polynomial. So the x that satisfy this uh, polynomial below uh, make up the union of subspaces, okay? So varieties are, you know, a very rich uh, uh, type of um, model that we can use. And, you know, just to point out here, actually, it's something kind of different from a manifold, okay? Manifolds are more general in other ways in the sense that they're not necessarily defined by polynomials, but um, a variety can be something that has like intersections and, um, and uh, points, uh, you know, where the dimensionality is different in a local region, which is different than a manifold. Okay, so this union of subspace model has applications ranging from internet tomography, uh, computer vision, and, and uh, genomics and bioinformatics. Um, and one of those applications, uh, we have a data set that really nicely uh, motivates what we're trying to do. So um, this data set is a drug discovery data set. And what we see in the matrix is for every drug on the rows and every uh, cell protein on the columns, uh, that point in the matrix gives whether that drug uh, had an interaction with the protein in an experiment, okay? So it's the level of interaction. Uh, and if you look at that matrix, it's approximately low rank. These singular values drop off pretty precipitously, around 60. Uh, on the other hand, if you use some expert knowledge to cluster these experiments in a particular way, uh, and you look at the singular values of these subsets of the matrix, uh, actually the rank is much lower. Um, the highest one in here, which is the left cluster, you can see is kind of the largest one, is rank 25. Uh, and so um, as Mark sort of talked about, if in the left side we need more than rank number of measurements per column, we would need maybe 65, 70. On the right side, if we knew this clustering, we would only need, say, 26, 30, something slightly more than uh, the rank of the smallest cluster, uh, the largest rank uh, of one of the clusters, okay? So that, you know, shows that there's some room uh, to improve the, the number of measurements you might need. Okay, so here's our problem. We have an incomplete matrix and we want to, uh, try to complete it, assuming the entry satisfies some unknown polynomial equation. And uh, we have one key observation that basically motivates all of our work, okay? So um, in this particular example, um, I'm showing uh, for a, what I'm gonna call a, a two-dimensional lifting. So I'm looking at um, polynomials of all the entries uh, uh, and, and their quadratic counterparts, so, so no higher monomials, right? No, no power of three polynomials. Um, so if X is our data column, uh, then X Kronecker X gives us um, all the possible pairs uh, in, in this matrix. Uh, so any two variables multiplied by each other. Um, but I'm gonna use this notation X uh, O times two or X Kronecker two um, to hold only the D choose two unique products, okay? So if there's X1, X2, and X2, X1, I'm just gonna copy it once into this uh, new column, okay? And I'm gonna call this um, a lifted column from the first one, okay? So we started with three variables, and now we have um, six. So this is a higher dimensional representation of our data column. So the observation is this, that um, if we take a new matrix uh, where we take each column and lift it, okay, so we have the same number of columns, but now a, a lifted matrix uh, in this higher dimensional space, then that lifted matrix is rank deficient if and only if the columns of the original matrix uh, belong to a proper algebraic variety, okay? So, and when I say rank deficient here, I mean, low rank, linear, low rank, what we're used to working with in matrix completion. 
Um, and I haven't also made any assumption on the polynomial of the algebraic variety that the unknown polynomial, it doesn't have to be uh, degree two, um, but if it's a proper algebraic variety, meaning it's uh, a strict subset of the whole space, uh, then we'll still have a rank deficient matrix in this lifted matrix. And actually this proposition is true for any lifting, so any power of P, okay? But here and in this talk, I'm just gonna focus on P equals two. Okay, so that's great. If we lift, then in the lifted space, we have something that's low rank and we know how to handle low rank incomplete matrices. So I'm just gonna propose an algorithm. Uh, we'll take our original data that lies on some unknown variety. We're gonna lift or tensorize it. Uh, every column uh, is this lifted version of the original column. In this space, the data are linear low rank, so we'll perform matrix completion. We'll have a complete matrix on the bottom right here. And then actually, uh, if, if this is exactly, um, you know, uh, exact completion, so there's no noise issues or anything, then each column can be perfectly uh, detensorized, in this case for p equals two, uh, back to the original space. You just have to look at um, XX transpose and take, uh, or sorry, rearrange the, the elements of this X Kronecker 2 and, and look at the first eigenvector of that matrix, okay? So that one is, is an exact uh, way of, of moving back to the original space. So that's really cool. Uh, you know, it makes sense if we're linear low rank in this lifted space, so we could use matrix completion. But the problem is then, um, how do we prove that low rank matrix completion is possible in this lifted context, okay, in this lifted space? And there's two really uh, key challenges that makes this problem um, significantly more difficult than uh, just applying matrix completion results that are already out there. So the first challenge is in sampling pattern assumptions. Um, most theory in matrix completion assumes uh, completely uniformly sampled uh, entries. And um, if, if not, maybe different rows or, or different columns are, you know, have more or less probability, but they're all, uh, observed independently from one another, uh, and that's in statistical literature called missing completely at random, okay? In our case, um, in the lifted space, that simply can't be true. So just looking at this simple case of D equals three, uh, if we subsample two of three entries, uh, there are only three possible ways we can get uh, two entries from these columns. And so that means in the lifted space, there are only three possible sampling patterns. Uh, of course, the lifted space here has six, uh, has dimension six. Uh, and so there are six choose two or 20 possible sampling patterns if we were sampling it directly, but we're not, okay? So we only get actually a very small fraction of the possible or of the sampling patterns in the lifted space. A very small fraction of them are admissible according to some sampling in the original space. Uh, the second key challenge that I'm not going to talk about in detail because it's a bit technical uh, is just a challenge of general position or incoherence assumptions. So you have to assume, like Mark said, that the original matrix is nice in some way. Um, and it's actually really hard to do for an algebraic variety, okay? Um, so uh, we have found a way uh, basically to get around that, um, that uh, sticking point in our theory, okay? So um, in order to tell you about our theory, I need to start uh, by telling you what canonical projections are. So our theory actually uh, is kind of um, a long route to matrix completion. What we really show is something different if we had like a much nicer, more um, idealistic sampling setting, and that's this. So canonical projections are projections of a subspace onto a collection of canonical basis elements, or really onto some of the coordinates, okay? So what I mean is if I say I want to sample coordinate one, five, and six, I get the whole subspace on coordinate one, five, and six, not just an entry of a matrix, okay? So that's what a canonical projection is. 
now we can relate it to matrix observations. And if you're interested, I can answer questions about that. Okay, so here's our most uh, general theorem. Um, if we have a variety uh, and its pth order tensorized subspace is capital R dimensional, okay? So that capital R uh, is less than uh, little d choose two, which is now the number of rows, or capital N, which is the number of columns. Okay, and then uh, suppose that there exists one of these sampling patterns, these tensorized sampling patterns, for which the subspace on those coordinates is full rank. It has also this rank capital R, okay? Um, so this is where I'm kind of getting around uh, some of the need of, uh, of a general position um, subspace, okay? So I'm assuming that there's one observation pattern on which I get a full rank uh, view into the subspace. And as long as there's one, then that subspace is uniquely identifiable from the canonical projections onto all possible observation patterns of that size, okay? The same size as the one uh, that uh, gave us the full R-dimensional subspace. Okay, so this sounds pretty technical. Uh, I can answer questions, but let's look instead at a specific case of this theorem, um, and it might give you a little bit more concrete thing to think about. So if the columns of the original matrix are in a union of K R-dimensional subspaces, the rank of that matrix is uh, the minimum of the dimension and the samples, or k times r, the rank of those k subspaces. In the lifted space, uh, the rank is the minimum of d choose 2 and the number of samples, and then k times r choose 2. So the rank has only uh, increased, um, the rank of the union of subspaces is only increased according to the rank of each subspace not according to the number of subspaces. Okay, so it's increased linearly, or it's, it's uh, still linear in the number of subspaces. And so, uh, you know, K R choose two compared to D choose two is smaller than K R compared to D, right? So we can do uh, a better job in this lifted space. Okay, so here is the um, corollary that applies our earlier theorem directly to the union of subspaces. So we have a, a union of KR dimensional subspaces drawn uniformly and independently from the Grassmannian, so they're in general position. Um, and we're going to take its second order tensorized subspace, so I'm using a lifting uh, like I've showed so far to quadratic polynomials. Assume M0 is the smallest integer so that M0 choose 2 is bigger than this rank I'm telling you that we have in the lifted space. K times R choose two, okay? So uh, M naught is gonna be the minimum number we have in the original space. And then of course, when we uh, lift it, we get M naught choose two observations in the lifted space. So uh, in that case then, what we can show is there is one, at least one uh, tensorized observation pattern where the subspace is full rank in this lifted space. And so S is uniquely identifiable from its canonical projections onto the tensorized observation patterns of this size, okay? So this M0, which maybe is an intuitive idea that it should be um, how many samples you need in the original space, in fact it is, uh, and we also have necessary conditions that match that case. Um, like I said, we also have, we can connect it to like matrix completion theory or sampling, um, so if you want to think just about matrix completion, uh, we could say if you observe at least square root of k times r uh, number of samples per column, uh, and you have many, many columns observed in every possible pattern. So that's the place where we need to improve our theory. Uh, but then we, then we know that unique matrix completion is possible. And what's interesting is that Again, we have necessary conditions. So uh, if you have fewer uh, than this number of entries, uh, matrix completion in the lifted space is not possible for the quadratic tensorization. Okay, so um, that was our theory. I just have a couple numerical results. Um, this uh, 
Uh, these plots show a phase transition for synthetic union of subspace data. On the x-axis is the number of subspaces. On the y-axis is the sampling rate, the number of entries per column, uh, uh, the number of entries divided by the total dimension per column. And we have a, a handful of algorithms that are good for, for uh, union of subspace estimation, okay, in the middle there. Uh, and then our two algorithms on the right hand side. And you can see that especially like uh, uh, for larger values of K, uh, our algorithm is able to have um, some recovery. Those are the white, uh, the white squares in the box, uh, even where the other algorithms cannot, okay? Um, and this uh, red um, dotted line is showing you the square root K times R bound that we talked about. Um, and it lines up uh, pretty well with the phase transition that we see in the algorithms, okay? Uh, and lastly, we also tried to do some matrix completion on MNIST digits, um, uh, you know, also ripped off of Mark, I guess. Uh, and um, what we see here is the original digit, the, the subsample, then low rank matrix completion and low algebraic uh, dimension right or low algebraic dimension matrix completion R's on the very right. Uh, and you know, there's um, some interesting differences like in the six, you can see a lot more of the, um, the uh, six there in the seven, it's a lot more clear. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, this nonlinear structure we believe is bringing something new uh, to the matrix completion problem in these settings. Um, so that's all I have here is our, um, our preprint link if you're interested in more of those technical details. Um, and otherwise, I'll, I'll stop there. Should I look to see if there are questions? Is Bianca here? Uh, there are no questions for... Um for now, but I welcome uh, more questions from the audience. Uh, but while the questions are uh, being written in the chat, I have one, uh, one follow-up question, which is a little bit different in spirit from, from the content of your main presentation, but it's something that actually Mark's talk also, um, here's the camera inspire me to ask. So I'm very interested in active learning. And one of the things that I keep thinking about whenever I see this um, matrix completion talks is whether, do you think there's some improvement for this bounds if we had the choice to select particular entries in a, um, in a given order? Do you think there's space to improve the bounds or create algorithms? Or do you think it will still have the same level of complexity? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and for low rank matrix completion, people have been uh, thinking about that now for a little while. Um, there are a few um, good approaches, uh, and I can't think off the top of my head um, what the most recent like state of the art result there is. But um, they do show in certain settings that uh, if you can choose the entries adaptively, you can do better in terms of at least sampling complexity. I don't know about algorithmic efficiency. Um, but actually what's interesting about that problem, like when I thought about it during my PhD, I, was, I thought it would be a really neat uh, problem to solve. And what we realized right away was that if you have um, incoherence assumptions, which you need uh, for a lot of the matrix completion theory. So really what incoherence assumptions are doing is like making any entry sort of as good as any other entry. Um, and so the stronger your incoherence assumptions, the less adaptive sampling matters. Um, and it, you know, it makes sense because they were trying to prove that if you can sample uniformly at random, you can make a good completion, right? You can have a unique completion. So um, so adaptive sampling didn't really uh, matter in that case. And from what I understand, the recent results are basically asking, you know, if you don't know in advance how incoherent, you know, your matrix is, or, or let's say even uh, some columns are more or less uh, coherent, and you may need to sample more or less in different columns, uh, then how can you do that adaptively? Um, and, you know, so they, they sort of 
took, they changed the problem in a way that it makes it interesting again. So. Thank you. Uh, Boaz have actually two, two more questions. Okay. Uh, so from an information theoretic point of view, what do you lose by uh, doing the lifting in the tensorization? And uh, the second question from a computational point of view, it seems that if you start with very large matrices, you can increase the dimension quadratically. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. So the second one is easy to answer. So I'm going to answer that one first. So yeah, uh, if we actually perform matrix completion in this like D to the P new space. So right now I just showed you for quadratic tensorization, but you could use, you know, any higher order tensorization and then the space will get bigger and bigger. Um, then uh, uh, the, the complexity uh, explodes basically. Uh, though we believe, and we've done this a little bit, that you could use sketching methods, so you could uh, still do some kind of uh, completion in a much compressed dimensionality setting. Um, our original algorithm actually wanted to avoid that altogether, so we did a kernelized uh, method. Um, and so that, in that case, the dimension is, uh, is irrelevant, but the number of samples is very relevant and actually um, it seems like to do completion in some of these problems you need the number of columns to be large and so your kernel matrix is n, n by n. Um, so I guess the question will be like how big does it have to be and uh, we use some sketching methods like in kernel PCA in that algorithm as well. Um, so that's how I answered the complexity problem. The first question was information theoretically, what do you lose by going to this lifted space? Uh, and actually, I'm not totally sure, uh, like, what do you have in mind? Is there something you can say to make it more clear what you're thinking about? So do you need many more samples than what you would have need if you had, I don't know, a supercomputer and worked directly on the matrix? I see. Yeah, so, um, uh, What's very interesting actually is that, so while we've proved that when you lift to this, um, to this new tensor, tensored space, tensorized space, that the um, variety or the data there are low rank, linear low rank, actually um, that doesn't like directly impose um, constraints of the variety. So, uh, so while this is a necessary condition, um, you know, let's say this some number of measurements is a necessary condition to complete it if you're trying to complete it as a low rank matrix. If instead you also had some like variety uh, constraints that you imposed, you would need fewer entries. Um, and so I would say it's not about the lifting that you lose something information theoretically, but it's about the idea that you're trying to only solve the problem using low rank structure in the lifted space. Um, so our original algorithm didn't do that. It also iteratively imposed the variety constraints, uh, in which case we see that we can use many fewer uh, samples than, than these bounds. I shouldn't say many fewer, just um, the phase transition plot is white below that line instead of um, instead of just above it. So, great. Thanks for the questions. Okay, so um, I think we can conclude the uh, conference here. Great. So uh, I want to thank um, Boaz and Bianca for organizing this with me. When I first got the idea, I was very pleased that other people were also excited about a, a workshop for missing data. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and then I really want to thank um, Sam and Michelle uh, Huginin, who helped so much to organize this workshop. Um, and then thanks to all the wonderful speakers. I think we really had a great group ranging from theory to practice uh, and everything in between. So uh, thank you everyone very much for, for joining us this week. And uh, I hope it's inspired some people to continue working on uh, the problems that people have brought up here this week. So thank you.